take a shot for every time we say the word leverage in this episode because like it's the name of the game it's everywhere it's all over the place drink responsibly but drink responsibly you're listening to the startup podcast this is an educational episode in-depth masterclasses about the concepts essential to building running and investing in silicon valley style startups whether you're a founder, investor, or operator in a startup, you'll gain insights into the principles that power high growth disruption the same way Facebook, Google, and Uber do it. The conversation starts now. Hey, I'm Chris Saad. And I'm Yaniv Bernstein. And on today's show, we're going to talk all about leverage. In fact, you're going to get so sick of that word, it's going to drive you crazy. Take a shot every time we say the word leverage. We're going to cover what is leverage, and that might actually surprise you what it means specifically and how you might think about it. How does leverage play a key role in everything to do with life and being a founder? What are the forms of leverage and how should you think about those? And how to leverage yourself in the early days of your startup? All that and more in this week's episode of the Startup Podcast. Stay tuned. This episode of the Startup Podcast is brought to you by Vanta. You might know that sinking feeling. You're about to land a big contract when they ask about compliance. SOC 2, ISO, PCI, Essential 8. You've just snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Not anymore. Vanta massively accelerates your compliance efforts and allows you to get those life-changing deals back on track. Don't wait until it's panic stations, though. Get started with Vanta today. They're offering 20% off their prices just for TSP listeners. Do yourself a favor. Hit pause. Go to vanta.com slash TSP. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com to get that 20% off. All right, Yanev. So in recent weeks, you have posted on LinkedIn about leverage, and I thought it was a really cool article. So maybe let's unpack your post and deep dive into what it means, how founders can use it, and maybe some examples that will help founders really crystallize this in their lives. Yeah, for sure. So actually, to take a step back, you know, I think leverage is really at the core of human progress. I think one of the things I wrote in that post was human progress comes from mastering and exploiting resources that lie beyond our own bodies and efforts that are not our own. And so I think it's really important to understand that that when we talk about leverage, that's what we mean. I saw in in some of the responses to my posts, even people straight away, when they hear leverage, they think about financial leverage, borrowing money or whatever. And that is certainly a form of leverage. But leverage goes back millennia. Right? The use of fire is leverage. The use of livestock is leverage. The thing that has made humans the dominant species on Earth is that we're able to harness resources way beyond our own limited abilities. And more than that, every improvement in human lifestyle and human well being and human progress has been tied to the ability to harness more of those external resources for our own purposes. So, again, from fire through to the Industrial Revolution, like I said, harnessing livestock and then using computers and all of these things. These are leverage. These are saying, I can do more because I don't have to do it all myself. And I think, like I said, that's a really core principle of human progress. But if you are starting a startup, you have to absolutely maximize this, right? I think a lot of people these days are benefiting from the leverage that's being given to them by others. These days you're born and you've got electric light and access to a motor vehicle and God knows what. But people don't always have the initiative. Whereas if you're a founder, you need to be thinking, how am I able to master and exploit resources that lie beyond my own body every day? The story of human history is, in my mind, rooted in two incredible breakthroughs, tools and language. And when you talk about leverage, I guess it touches both, but most directly touches tools, right? And let's just get really very, very pragmatic here. Leverage is the exertion of force through a lever. The most basic example you could possibly imagine is some kind of crowbar, right? And you stick it in a door jam and you pull it or twist it to try to break open that door. The other is a seesaw where the fulcrum point is not in the middle, but is actually placed in such a way that a little pressure on one side applies or exerts a lot of pressure on the other side. Ironically, I'm not convinced that the physical lever from which the metaphor comes is genuine leverage in the sense that we mean it, right? Because that's about saying, I'm still using only my own force, but I'm concentrating. And I think that's valuable too. But I think when we often talk about leverage now, is it's saying, I am bringing in external force and mastering it. I think that's actually a really important aspect of it too. In my mind, leverage is about magnifying your effort. So whether you magnify it by applying that effort in the right way to the right fulcrum point, or you apply it in such a way that you get others to help you apply that effort, 
The point is to apply your force A and get outcome A times X. You could never have done it on your own. You could not have done it on your own. Or rather, maybe you not have made that large an impact with that little of force on your own, to be very, very precise. Mm. And I really like what you said, which is that leverage is everywhere in the world. You are the beneficiary of leverage that other people created for you, right? Civilization in all of its forms is a form of leverage. As you said, cultivating livestock and paving roads and turning on electricity is leverage you take for granted. It's in the water, it's baked in. And the question as a founder, as an effective operator in the world is, what leverage advantages can you add over the top of the leverage you've been handed to you as a birthright? You might even think of like leverage at birth is privilege. Not a bad way of thinking of it. And then what extra hustle will you apply to get additional privilege, additional leverage? The classic example here is one I think Steve Jobs used to use, where scientists decided to study the most efficient animal in terms of locomotion getting around the world. And they determined that big cats, I think specifically cheetahs, were amongst the most efficient land-moving animals. And humans were like way, way down the list. It's just like, just not that efficient at all on our little two-legged bipedal motion. Until you compared a human on a bicycle. Now, when you put a human on a bicycle, they are just by far the most efficient animal in the land-moving animal kingdom. And this is a great example of our ability to, A, create tools that extend our reach and create leverage. And so the bicycle has been used by Steve Jobs and others as this like just perfect example of leverage, of human leverage using tools. Now we're way down the rabbit hole of like talking about obvious things, but like the calculator helps you with mental leverage, helps you do math more easily. The computer, of course, helps you do pretty much everything with leverage. You talked about the financial leverage, Jan Evan. I think it is an important form of leverage and it's important to talk about borrowing money from the bank to get a larger investment home or to get more investment homes so that the capital gains of those homes and the yield of those homes is larger than you could have gotten on your own and larger than the interest you would pay to the bank. That is leverage. And you know, you find people in, let's call them civilians in the non-entrepreneurial world who are afraid to death of debt and by extension, leverage. You actually meet founders who say, well, I don't want to raise capital because I don't want to have a boss or I don't want to have the pressure. And what you're saying is I don't want leverage. It's very, very hard to win in Silicon Valley style, high scale startups without leverage. And of course, now let's really start to connect this to startups. Building a company is a form of leverage. As Yanev touched on, it's the difference between pressing on that lever by yourself and getting a group of people together, aligning their incentives and getting them to all press on the lever together. And that's why a company exists. It's a company of people. It's a collection of people, right? And then to use it very, very tactically, building a website, building a self-serve onboarding funnel versus having one-on-one -on -one phone calls is a form of leverage. It's a form of accelerating your growth and making things happen when you're not even inside the room. So I just want to go through all of those examples and A, give people a sense that like they're benefiting from leverage. B, it's a game of getting unfair additional leverage. And C, leverage exists at kind of all layers and in all aspects of life. And some people even try to avoid it and fear it because they don't know how to use it. Leverage is how you concentrate your power and extend your will further. And when I say that leverage is at the core of what a founder does, if you're looking at building a billion dollar company, no person with their bare hands can create a billion dollars worth of value. It is absolutely impossible. And so if you want to build a billion dollar company, you have to make massive use of leverage. And yes, Chris, you talked about capital. And if you look at the podcast that they were more on the sort of take venture capital side, but I actually think the most important leverage within a startup, within a tech startup is software. It is one of the massive unlocks. When we talk about why are tech startups eating the world? Why is tech eating the world? Why does the venture model work so well with tech startups? And we've talked about it extensively in previous episodes about the high margins. That comes from leverage, right? Because when you use software, what you have is the ability to replicate your efforts nearly infinitely at very low marginal cost, right? You can create a piece of software and millions of people use it. Similar for content, right? You can record one podcast and hopefully one day millions of people will listen to that too, right? Without any additional effort from our part. And so that leverage is at 
the core. And I think having that as one of the lenses you use to think, how are we generating leverage? Because if you are simply putting one foot in front of the other, and a lot of the things, Chris, also, by the way, that we advise against, for example, building a technology-backed services business can also be viewed through this lens because they have more limited leverage. It's not that they have no leverage. Like we've been discussing, everything in life has leverage, but the leverage is more limited and therefore the ability to scale really rapidly is more limited. And that's where the problem comes in. That is both obvious and brilliant. We've talked about this in previous episodes, but it wasn't even top of mind as we started, which is that in tech startups, software is at the heart of the leverage story. And what kind of boggles my mind is to this day, I have met with companies in my advisory work where I have indicated, of course, we are at the intersection of software and X, you know, at this company. Mm. And the response was, well, actually, we're not sure about that, Chris. We don't know if we really want to be a software company. And I was like, let me pause you right there. Every company is a software company. It is the essential point of leverage in today's economy. You're right. This is a way of thinking about the technology-backed services company because they're using the language and the technology of software, but they're not using it with leverage. They're selling services. They're selling the ability to build software, but they're not using the software for leverage. I know we've got listeners out there who are probably grinding their teeth. Not every business is a software business and technology-backed services business can produce a very nice stream of income for people. But what you're doing is you are not maximizing your leverage. And if you want to get the big outcomes, you have to maximize your leverage. So I think, you know, there's a nuance there. I think the sentiment is right, but you are taking it to an extreme. <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast and you are building software, custom software to any meaningful degree, and you are calling yourself a startup, you're using the wrong language and you are wasting everyone's time. And if you are building any company of any scale, trying to make any kind of impact in the world, I'm not even talking about high leverage Silicon Valley style companies now. If you are building a company of any meaningful scale and you do not think of yourself as having a meaningful software function, that is criminal. Software is an essential core business for every company. People need to get clear eyed about this crap. If you are building cars, if you are building furniture, if you are building healthcare, and you do not think about software to get leverage in your business, then you are, by definition, not looking at the business with any kind of ambition, any kind of leverage, and any kind of scale. We basically agree, but I think there's still some nuance here worth exploring. And in fact, in a recent React episode, we talked about WeWork, right? WeWork was an office space company that wished it was a software company. And not just wished, of course. It projected itself as a software company, but it just wasn't, right? They had a software function. The software was okay, whatever, but they weren't going to get the leverage out of the software because fundamentally what they were selling was office space. And so when you say business of any scale, you can build a business of significant scale where software plays more of a supporting role. You still get leverage up from it, but you're not going to get that core leverage. However, you are not going to get those Silicon Valley style margins, which is why we work as a business, not actually as a service, which is pretty good as a business has collapsed because they wished themselves into being a software company, but they simply were not. And so I think there is that nuance there where simply like closing your eyes and you know, clicking your heels three times and saying we're a software company doesn't necessarily make you one. It's funny, you know, I don't know why I didn't raise this when we were talking about on the React episode, but when I left Uber, I got a lot of inbound recruiters and one of them was recruiting for a head of product or head of software product at WeWork. And what she admitted to me was the instructions she basically got and the signal she got was, we've raised a lot of money at a very high valuation and we don't have a software story and we yep. don't know how to build leverage into this business. And we desperately need, she said this to me, we desperately need someone like you to come in and to help us build a software story with real leverage so that we can justify the valuation. I actually, I had forgotten that story. Well, there you go. And I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> I forgot that story and I should have raised it in the Reacts episode. No, this is a better place for it. I do want to tie a bow on this because I think this disagreement isn't, you know, it's a bit of fun, but there's something mm. deeper here, right? Which is what you're saying, Chris, is if you're building this startup and you're not thinking about how to leverage it with software, that's criminal. 
I would nearly flip it around and say, be very careful with your business concept and make sure that it is leverageable as well, right? So there's two sides of it. There are some businesses that, again, software plays a supporting role. It can improve efficiencies. It can improve customer experience. But if I'm running a cafe, then I can't leverage that with software, right? And so know the game that you're playing. We're talking about, okay, make sure you're picking a startup that is well suited to this game. Yeah. So if you're trying to build a business of any scale, software needs to be part of your leverage story. Obviously, that plays out to various degrees depending on the business. Yes. And certainly Silicon Valley style tech companies are rooted in software and are therefore potentially the highest leverage kind of business. But even in a restaurant, right, you find these restaurants that are using paper note taking they're using rudimentary point of sale systems and they are not on Uber Eats for the sake of argument, right? Yep. So they have massive fixed capital outlay that they're not leveraging with incremental demand from Uber Eats. They have too many staff making too many errors on paper. They have no QR code order at table. They have no digital ordering. They have nothing. They are not using software for leverage. And so every business can have a software leverage advantage to the degree that that category allows it to eke out additional margin and operational efficiency or to potentially entirely disrupt the category. And Silicon Valley style companies are, of course, on the other end of that spectrum, on the disruption side. So let's talk about the most powerful ways you can use leverage in your business. And specifically, we've touched on software, we've touched on money, we want to go a little deeper on those, and we want to touch on labor and content. So we've talked about software and like the core underlying dynamics. Software is very low marginal cost to reproduce, and that's the core of the leverage. But then, you know, when you have leverage, it's like electricity. You need to talk about what you do with it. And I know you've got some thoughts you want to share on that. Yeah, that's right. So when we talk about software, we're talking specifically about three kinds of software, I think. Software that automates your operations, automates your business processes, your core business processes, HR and finance and what have you. That's a fairly traditional and typically marginal form of leverage using software. Then there is software in the sense of building a product once and selling it to thousands or millions of people and not having to custom build software over and over and over again. So this is the difference between products and services, between a product company, a technology-backed services company. And then we're talking about product-led growth. That is software that sells and onboards users for itself versus throwing labor at it, throwing sales and customer support at the problem. And so this is software leverage in terms of onboarding new customers and supporting customers. So those are the three kinds of software leverage you can get typically in a Silicon Valley style startup. I'd actually add one, Chris, I was thinking as you were talking, which is network effects, right? So product-led growth is, that's great. People come to you and you don't have to spend labor onboarding them, but network effects are that next level of leverage, which is the more you use software to grow, the more valuable that software becomes. And so you have that accelerating flywheel of growth. The biggest tech companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they all benefit from these network effects where their scale actually allows them to exploit even more leverage from their software because people come to them. Yeah, that's right. And that's specifically, of course, software that leverages the data, the people and the behavior to make the product better. And we've talked about network effects in previous episodes and, and just how absolutely critical they are to build. You're right, Yanev, this is like next level leverage from software and from internet software specifically, typically, because all of the users are connected and there's a shared infrastructure. So the next form of leverage, we've touched on this lightly already, is money. And we wanted to go a little deeper on that. Of course, in Silicon Valley style startups, there's typically two forms of leverageable money. And then there's one form of standard money. So there's revenue, which is standard money every business gets. And then there is venture capital and venture debt, which is really the money that's more about leverage. I've been talking to a few founders lately, Chris, and there's a funny thing about the, the Silicon Valley tech game, which is it comes with an assumption that you need to be raising money. And that's generally true. But again, a lot of them are like, oh, I'm building a startup, so I need to go raise. And it's like, no, you raise when you need to raise and you need to know why you're raising. So what is it structurally about tech startups that makes raising capital such an important form of leverage? 
Money is basically the system that we as a civilization have invented to allow us to go back to what we're talking about with leverage, master and exploit resources that lie beyond our own bodies and efforts that are not our own. Money is the most versatile tool that allows you to do that. And so when you talk about money at your startup, again, I think it's really important to think of it as this tool that allows you to gain more leverage. And while that might seem trite, I think the important thing to consider is when you're spending money or when you're raising money in order to spend it, you need to be thinking, how do I maximize the leverage from this money? Because money can be very easy to just spend, to just kind of piss away in daily operations. And if you do that, then you'll end up in a lot of trouble. I've seen a lot of startups do that and end up in a lot of trouble. So you must be using your money to build leverage, to have leverage that you wouldn't otherwise be able to have. All other things being equal, but be mindful and thoughtful about how you use it. I think that's really the kind of high level message. It's often said fairly casually, money is a store of value. I often think of money as a store of energy actually. And it's a flow of energy between people. And it helps me to feel less, you know, people tend to feel icky about money. There's narratives about money is the root of all evil. And when you think about money as just energy flowing from people, between people, and that the energy flows in a circuit, it's not something you collect or pool. It's something that you get for creating value and you give for getting value. But actually, in this context, you can think of money as a store of leverage, actually. It's leverage that you have gained somewhere in space and time that you've converted into cash, into dollars, that you can then exert that leverage in another place in your life. It's the displacement of leverage across time and space. I think that's a really powerful way of thinking about it. And to continue that metaphor, you most easily and most ethically, I guess, are able to collect large sums of money by giving others large forms of leverage often framed as creating value. And often that value is leverage for others. And so it's a really interesting dynamic that I'm trying to tease out here, which is it's not just about using leverage and using money as leverage, but recognizing that you want to, in your products, in terms of solving problems, giving people leverage, creating leverage for others, and getting a commensurate amount of money, stored leverage in your bank account in return. And I just really think it's so important to reframe money that way because so many people have a bad relationship with money. And I think unwinding that narrative is really important. I mean, of course, there are other things you can do with money, like I don't think eating a nice meal is leverage, but a lot of the value that's created in the world is increasing the leverage of others. And I think that's absolutely true. The point I wanted to make actually is the really key interplay between these two forms of leverage we've discussed, money and software. And we've discussed this in previous episodes, but again, I think viewing it through this lens is interesting. Software has this ultimate leverage, but it also has generally a lot of expense that goes into creating that leverage in the first place. And so when you talk about money being stored energy, a lot of the times the way you get leverage is by borrowing money. So you're taking someone else's stored energy and you're saying, well, we'll use it. And from that leverage, I will get extra energy and I will give it back to you. Venture debt is absolutely something that startups do. But with debt, generally what you're saying is, okay, I borrow your money now and I'll straight away get a modest amount of leverage. And then I'll use that extra leverage to generate more income and pay you back. So the reason why venture capital and software are such a chocolate and peanut butter combination is because of the massive leverage afforded by software. You need more money up front and you're probably taking bigger risks, but the amount of leverage generated and therefore the amount of returns from that are just absolutely epic if you get it right. So the difference between venture capital and debt, I think this is important to understand. I mean, the mechanisms are different, but the different utility of those two types of money is that debt is for less risky, more incremental gains in leverage. Venture is for riskier, but exponential gains in leverage. And that is why you should not be taking venture capital unless you are trying to build a startup that is trying to aim for these types of returns, right? For really having that big impact. And that is why most tech startups need to be doing something in software because that is where that leverage is. That is where those exponential returns are. Yeah, that's right. We've talked about this in previous episodes, this idea that venture capital is almost uniquely a software and internet phenomena. It's not exclusively, but it is extra special in the Silicon Valley high-tech world. It's extra special, a special source. 
of course, there are other companies and other models and other reasons why venture capital works, but it works so, so well with software and especially with software on the internet because of leverage. This episode of the Startup Podcast is brought to you by Vanta. The team at Vanta are passionate about helping you secure your business by vastly cutting down on the time to get compliant with frameworks like ISO 27001, SOC 2, and Essential 8. Vanta lets you close deals, sleep better at night, and get back to building your product. Help yourself and help the podcast by going to vanta.com slash TSP for an exclusive 20% off deal. The next form of leverage, of course, in any business, even traditional businesses, but in a startup as well, is labor. We've talked about this idea that you want to hire people who are better than you, and you want to hire people who you can delegate effectively parts of the job, parts of the work. Of course, that's all about leverage. You don't have to be physically moving the pixels, physically moving the slides, physically selling the product. And those people allow you to speak once to some other human beings, and then they go off and do the work. They go off and create outsized impact for you. I think it's fairly straightforward. Absolutely. But I think it's interesting and important. Again, what leverage provides is this unifying mental framework. Why do you hire people? Because then you can leverage their labor to do what you want. And it'll come back to this. There's not too much to be said about it now, but we'll come back when we talk about leveraging yourself as a founder. I think this is a really key one. You know what? Let's go back a step. Let's talk about ways of breaking leverage. You find founders doing all the right motions, but they're still not getting leverage. And that's because they're undermining the leverage. They're using the same words or the same technologies or techniques, but they're inadvertently undermining the leverage inherent in those techniques. We've talked a lot, a lot, a lot about this, but with software, you can undermine the software leverage by custom building software for each customer. That's no longer using software for leverage. With money, you can undermine the leverage of money by being fixated on revenue because revenue is low leverage, right? It's not a high leverage form of money because you don't get it all up front to apply strong pressure to the seesaw, right? To the action that you're trying to lever. And so revenue is valuable and certainly turning revenue into cash reserves is valuable, but day-to-day business as usual revenue is not high leverage. And in the form of labor, you can undermine the leverage of your labor by not giving them great context and by micromanaging and by hiring poor people, bad people, people that are a bad fit for your company and for the role. And so you've gone through all the motions, you've hired all the people, you have a bunch of people laying around in your company, but those people are not giving you leverage or at least not effective leverage. So you can see here where founders might be going off and doing the right things. They're playing with money. There's money in the bank account. They're playing with software. There's code being written. They're playing with the idea of hiring people and building a team, but they're not getting leverage. And that's, I think, really important to talk about is the concept itself doesn't give you the leverage. It's using the concept, using the tool in the right way that gives you the leverage. Like with any tool, like you hand me a power tool and I'm not going to extract leverage from it because I'm not going to use it properly. And so I think that's absolutely right. And that's what we're sort of trying to say here is that you need to use those lower levels of leverage, like labor and money to create the really high leverage thing, which is often going to be software that will take you to that epic level of scale. And if you're using that leverage for anything else, then you are distracting yourself from that. You're using resources suboptimally and kind of cutting yourself off from that path. And if you've taken venture capital, then that's fatal. Let's talk about another big form of leverage that I think is dear to our hearts, Chris, as podcasters, but I think more and more companies and founders are understanding its value is content because content is the other thing that is like software, especially, you know, now that it is digital, it is in a sense a type of software that has a near zero marginal cost of distribution, right? I think that's what software and content have in common. You can create content once and one person could see it or a thousand or a million or a hundred million. I mean, look at Taylor Swift. She's on tour at the moment here in Australia. And it's just insane, the leverage she is getting on her content. And so I think that's something that's also a really interesting thing. Obviously, there are a lot of businesses that are content businesses. Those tend not to be Silicon Valley style startups. Content businesses tend to top out lower than software businesses. But leveraging content to put fuel on the fire, I think, of your software business is extremely valuable. And there are, of course, multiple types of content that are, let's say, optimized for leverage. So there's content that you might describe as context setting content for your organization. And we've spoken extensively about this in terms of how to scale your startup and using principles and cultural values and business strategies that are shared context internally 
to get the most leverage out of your labor, out of your people. And so that is content that creates leverage out of people. And then there is educational content, which is a way of driving leverage out of customers and out of users so that they can use that software better and not have to touch your customer support team as much. And then there is, you know, of course, marketing content, which helps you reach more people, educate more people and convert more people at scale rather than having to dial for dollars and be on a sales call for every user, every customer. And so all of this content and many other types, I'm sure, give you leverage in the world. And of course, to talk about podcasting directly, that helps you build audiences. It helps you build communities and ultimately build a channel, a top of funnel channel to sell your services into. Now, of course, the most epic example of this is Mr. Beast, right? He has created incredible leverage out of his content business to drive philanthropy, to drive confectionery sales. You know, he did burgers for a while. It's just huge, huge leverage. Whatever business this guy spins up, his content farm and his content community is going to give him enormous leverage and drive success for him. So those are sort of the sources of power, as it were, and that's how you create leverage in your business. And the final thing that I wanted to talk about, Chris, is especially for founders, but anyone working at a startup or anyone in leadership at a startup is how do you leverage yourself? You are one person, but if you are the founder, if you are the CEO, you want to have the impact of much more than one person on your startup. And I think one of the things that I talk about quite a lot because it frustrates me is I see CEOs, founders who are not skilled at leveraging themselves. And because of that, they're limiting the operational ability of their startup to succeed. At the beginning stages of a startup, a founder does stuff directly, right? So they are not leveraging labor, right? They are the labor. And so they know everything about the product. They're in the tools. They're developing the software. They're on sales calls. They're doing the marketing, all of that. And that is correct and appropriate. It's the right thing to do for two reasons. One is because you don't have that much leverage yet in your business. You don't have money. You don't have other labor. You just got to do it yourself. And the other reason, of course, and we've talked about this in the past, is that founders need to learn how to do this. Founder-led sales is so important in building a sales organization, for example. And that's all well and good until you start scaling, you start building more leverage into your business, right? And once a certain level of scale is reached, everything you do as a founder should be about leverage. Your labor should not be direct labor. It should be leverage on your organization. And Chris, I think you often call this building the thing that builds the thing. And that's actually a massive pivot for founders to have to go from being the expert thing builder to being the person who is leveraging their efforts to make the organization effective. The ideal CEO situation is, apart from a couple of massive strategic decisions you have to do once in a while, everything you do should be about leverage, right? Hiring is about leverage. It's about bringing on that labor that can do things effectively. Culture is about leverage. We've talked about this. Culture and communication is about leverage. These things mean that when you are not in the room, when you are not hands on the tools, the people who are doing the things, your employees, they do the things that you would do the way that you would do them, right? That is amazing leverage because you've effectively cloned yourself. You've photocopied yourself. And as a founder, you've obviously got a vision. You believe in yourself. You believe in what you're doing. You want to extend that power, that execution power throughout your whole team. That is why you're bringing on a team. You get their skills, but also you want them to understand what you believe in and how you think so that they can do it without you. And that is the core role of a founder at a scaling organization. Yeah, and have you said you photocopy yourself? What is photocopying? <laughs> it's when you take a selfie and then you email it to your printer. I wasn't sure you'd be able to do anything with that, but that was that was way better than I expected. <laughs> Witty man. Oh, uh, dear. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the name of the game, folks. I think we're going to record the intro at the end. So here's a bit of behind the scenes. We're going to say, take a shot for every time we say the word leverage in this episode, because like, it's the name of the game. It's everywhere. It's all over the place. Drink responsibly. But drink responsibly. But you know, like it's just baked in. It's baked in. And it's another lens. It's another framing. It's another way of looking at everything we've been talking about over the last, what, a hundred and some episodes. It is just so intrinsically linked to being an effective human being, to being an effective founder, to being an effective CEO, and to being an effective operator of your business. It is just baked in. And if you don't spend enough time thinking about leverage, or in some cases, you're afraid of leverage, you know, in the form of debt and other things, you need to check in with your own psychology. I will often meet too many founders 
who are just spending their time on the wrong things, spending their time with the wrong people, getting or deriving gratification or pleasure or excitement from things that are just not useful and therefore have no leverage. And we've talked about some of these things before in the past, and Evan, some of these things are controversial, but like spending way too much time out there in the community, right? There's a saying we used to use in Silicon Valley is he'll come to the opening of a potato chip packet. It's just like, mm. calm down on all of that, right? Spending all this time on just like dialing in things to false precision, P&Ls, or even brand exercises, which just do not matter. Get it roughly right. Move on and just be focused on leverage and avoid diminishing returns and low leverage activities that are just not gonna move the needle. One other thing I want to mention when you talk about leveraging yourself as a founder is the question of when you should get an assistant, an EA or whatever it is. And I think this is something that I see others and myself also think about in the wrong way, because I think probably from watching Mad Men or something like that, you see an executive assistant as a bit of an indulgence, as a bit of a luxury, as a bit of a status symbol and that you don't play that game, right? I see a lot of founders who have the capital, who have the need for someone to help them get the most leverage out of themselves, kind of stubbornly refusing to hire an assistant. And I see them, you know, spending half an hour just rescheduling meetings every day and like answering their own meeting request emails and dealing with their own crap. And I think my advice, which I said, I'm not always that good at taking, but that doesn't mean it's not good advice. <laughs> is that actually as a founder, you should be thinking about getting an assistant of some sort. I know there are good offshore VA services and so on these days as early as possible, because if you actually track the amount of busy work that you are doing as a founder each day, that someone else could be doing for you, it's quite a lot. And busy work, when we say busy work, another way of thinking of busy work is low leverage activity, right? Get that shit off your plate so you can focus on the high leverage stuff. So have a think. We don't have any VA agencies currently sponsoring us, but if you're listening to this and you run one, maybe that would be good because I actually think it's a great idea. And we're looking for a VA for the startup podcast. So reach out if you have a good one. So if you're sitting there going, damn, I want to maximize my leverage of my startup and I'm not quite sure how I need advice. Well, I know who can give it to you. It's Mr. Leverage himself. It is Chris Saad. Chris, I know you work with a small number of companies to help them boost their leverage and really play like a Silicon Valley style tech startup. That's right. And leverage is part of the game and bringing on advisors is about leverage. It's about fast forwarding to the future, moving as fast as you can and maximizing the outcome from the resources you have. So I'd love to hear from you if you're working on a Silicon Valley style startup and want to avoid dead ends, landmines and waste of time and fast forward into the future. Feel free to reach out to me via chrissard.com slash advisory and subscribe to my newsletter at chrissard.com slash newsletter. That's right. Put leverage in your leverage so you can leverage while you leverage. Now, just before we stop saying that word, <laughs> I would also like to mention the leverage that we get when any of you honor the Startup Podcast Pact. We love producing this content, but honestly, we're only going to keep doing it if we can maximize our leverage from it. And that means bringing more dedicated listeners to TSP. That is where you come in. If you have been listening to the Startup Podcast and getting value from it, please recommend it to your friends. Give us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify and give us a shout out on LinkedIn. It means a lot. And it really does help us grow and provide you a better startup podcast. Catch you the next one. Bye-bye. See ya. This episode of the Startup Podcast was brought to you by Vanta. Vanta helps businesses get and stay compliant by automating up to 90% of the work for the most in-demand compliance frameworks. With over 200 integrations, you can easily monitor and secure the tools your business relies on. Head to vanta.com slash TSP for 20% off their incredible offering and start unlocking extra revenue today.